Amen. Amen. Well, hey, so you say hey to everybody joining us online. Give them some love. Let them know we're grateful that they're here. It's still weird to me that people are leaning in to this little old church in Randleman and from all over the world. Preston Steele, who you saw earlier, and you're going to see a little bit more, a little bit later, his brother lives in Japan, and he watches us. So aren't you grateful that God is using something as evil as the internet to take the gospel to the world? Come on, give God some praise for the fact that he's doing amazing things all around the world. Um, every time I pick this thing up, I feel like a WWE superstar. In another life, in another calling. And I know you are thinking, I should have never came to this church. That dude's weird. I knew it all along. Uh, because some of y'all are like, why is he holding a chair? But where you see just a really cheap black chair, I see a whole lot more. See, there's some of y'all that, that, that y'all are spoiled because you never went through the setup years. We, we've been in this building now, in February will be three years, and that's a whole nother story if you're new to our church, because I know a lot of you guys are fairly new. Maybe you just started coming since, since COVID hit and you found us online. That's another cool thing. There are people that are all over this community that just stumbled upon us online during the shutdown, and now they get to sit in this room every week, and I think that's awesome. But where you see uh, just a simple, cheap black chair, there's a group of us that see a whole lot more than that when we see these. And we don't have a whole lot of them left, but there was a time that every single weekend, people said in these and not those. Aren't you grateful that you're here now? Because this thing is as uncomfortable as it is cheap, I'm not gonna lie. But for five years, when we worshiped across the street at Randall Middle School, this is what people sat in. And every weekend, every Friday night, there would be people that did this. Hundreds of these, all in converting a middle school gymnasium into a place of worship. And then every Sunday, we got really good. Y'all see that? I could, we could do setup in the Olympics and win gold. And see, there's a lot of people that what you see is just a simple, really cheap black chair. But when I see these, I see so much more. I'm reminded of the people that sacrificed so much to get our church here. See, there would be people every single Friday night, people that would work real jobs, some 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And then they would come straight to Randall and Middle School. Maybe if they had time, they'd grab a bite to eat on their way. Or they'd swing up and pick up a kid just to relieve a parent and they'd be running wild around that middle school for a few hours. And we would transform Randall Middle School into a place of worship. And we did it, man. We would be there every Friday night for five, six hours. And there was not a whole lot of us, but there was a faithful few that every other weekend, that was, that was how we served our church. And I remember all the time, people would ask me, Matt, how do you get people to do that? Because when you would walk into that school, it was, it was amazing what we did to it. And people would, other pastors, especially church planters, would say, Matt, how, how do you get people to do that? And I would be like, that is a phenomenal question. Because I don't know either. How do you get people to sacrifice so much in order to make vintage happen week in and week out? And so one, one night it set up, we were doing this. like we did every Friday night. And there was a guy that set up with me every single week. His name was Goosey Kennedy. That's right, I said Goosey. That is not his God-given name, but somehow he got saddled with it by the grace of God. And Goosey was one of those guys that, Goosey has 37 children. Not quite that many, but it's close. He's in construction and works a demanding job. And most Friday mornings, he would be up by 4 a.m. and work all day and come straight to the middle school to help set up. And he was faithful. If Goosey wasn't there, there was, there was a really, not an excuse, there was a reason. Y'all know the difference. And I asked him one time, I said, Goosey, I gotta ask you, man, why do you do this? And he sat down in a chair and he said, I do this, Matt, because I know that every Friday night, 
I'm not just putting out a chair. I'm creating an opportunity for somebody to sit in that seat and find Jesus. This church has changed my life. It's changed my family's life. And I'm creating an opportunity when I set that chair out for it to do the same in the life of somebody else. And so this chair to you might look like an old ratty chair, and it is. But for me, it represents everything that has made this church great. Everything that has taken this church from 12 people in a living room to about 25 people in one middle school to about 100 people in one high school to about 500 people in another middle school to however many people we're reaching now. That there have been people that have believed in the mission and bought into the vision. And because those people have done that, we're here and God's still inspiring people to live in love like Jesus. That the reason why I'm able to stand up here and preach for the 12th time a series called Live Love, where we dive into our mission. And for us, in case you're new and maybe you haven't been here throughout this series, when we say mission, it equals why. Our mission is our why. When we say mission, it is why we exist. And it's plain and it's clear and you hear it at every turn. You see it when you walk in that lobby. We exist to inspire people to live and love like Jesus. And the reason why we're still here when we probably shouldn't be is number one is because people have believed in that mission to their very core. They didn't believe in the name on a sign. They believed in in a mission, an assignment that was given to them by Jesus himself. And we've just helped people recognize it and realize it and watch it be unleashed in their lives. But people have done more than just believed in a mission. They bought into the vision. And when we say vision at our church, we're talking about how. How we go about inspiring people to live in love like Jesus. Mission equals why and vision equals how. And there's four things that we try to do as a church. And we've been unpacking those four things. We want to create an experience, an atmosphere, an opportunity, and a platform. That how we go about inspiring people to live in love like Jesus is every single weekend, we create an experience where people can gather in one space, authentically worship God, and lean into his truth, the gathering. But if we're going to really inspire people to live in love like Jesus, you got to buy into the whole vision, not just one part. Because if you never move beyond the gathering, you won't grow, amen? You have to have the courage to step out of the experience and into an atmosphere where anyone can build lifelong, life-giving relationships that provide care and accountability. That when we have the courage to get out of these rows and into circles and sit across from another human being, look into their eye and have conversation, be vulnerable and transparent, spiritual work gets done. But can I tell you something? The gathering can never happen and the groups aren't possible if it weren't for the those that people that take advantage of the third thing we try to do, create an opportunity. See this next thing I'm gonna unpack today, if people don't seize the opportunity, then the experience and the atmosphere never happen. Are you with me? That the reason why you're able to sit in this room today or sit on the other side of a screen wherever you're watching from, the reason why you're able to step out of these rows and into a circle is because there have people for years been willing to lean into the opportunity that we provide for you to discover and deploy your God-given gifts, building his church and advancing his mission. And that's the third thing that we want people to grab hold of in order to inspire people to live in love like Jesus, that we create an opportunity to discover and deploy your God-given gifts, serving the church and advancing the mission. It's people that have been willing to lean into that part of our vision that set out chairs for five years and now stand behind cameras so that the mission goes all over the globe or stand on this platform and hold an instrument or sit in a room right now and deal with your children or stand out in the rain so that somebody feels loved and welcome 
that the reason why we are able to inspire people to live in love like Jesus is because, yeah, people move beyond the experience and even out of the atmosphere and take hold of the opportunity that this church gives them to discover and deploy their God-given gifts, serving the church and advancing his mission. That from the beginning, people in this church have understood that church ain't a spectator sport like most of us have made it. Most of our church experience is limited to us sitting in it and never serving it. But the church was never intended to be a place where you sit. It is the people with whom you serve. That from the very beginning of this thing, Jesus was doing more than just inviting us to follow and spectate. He was inviting us to come alongside and serve with. Go to the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus first calls those first followers, he's not just inviting them into something that allows them to sit on the sidelines. Matthew chapter four, verse 19. Jesus said, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. I think if we're honest, the way most of us have read this in church over the years is Jesus said, come and follow me and watch me fish. But from the beginning, Jesus has not just invited us to follow him, but he's called us to serve with him, that the ministry of his church is the responsibility of all his people. That how much further would the gospel be? How much more effective would the church be if we didn't have generations that left it to the professional Christians? Where for so often, so many of us thought, oh, I come to church and I pay my tithe so I can sit back and watch the preacher do his thing. After all, he only works on Sunday and Wednesday. And we got in this mindset that the church is a place we sit and be served instead of a place that we also serve. That if the church is gonna be everything that Jesus wants it to be, it requires the collective effort of everybody in it. That the reason why this church is doing what it's doing, the reason why it's done what it's done, is because so many people that sat where you're sitting have done more than just sit. They've made the decision to serve. And they've added elements to this church that would have been missing had they not responded to that call. People ask me all the time, like, Matt, why does Vintage see all that it sees when we're seeing so many other churches struggle and so many other churches in decline? What's the difference at Vintage? You know what I always say? I'm surrounded by better people. I'm surrounded by better people and people that aren't dependent on a paycheck. People that realize what Paul said in Ephesians is true. Ephesians chapter two. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I need to let you in on a little secret that maybe you don't know. You're not random. You're not random. There's nothing about you that's random. Even your little weird, quirky personality is given to you by God. You are formed and knit together and designed with purpose and for purpose. Come on, somebody. God, God wanted you to exist. And even in Acts, it says that he carves out the times and places in which we should live. Now, some of us have wished he'd have picked something other than 2020 for us. But you are where you are in this space and time because God designed it that way. You were created to contribute to his kingdom, to his church, to something of inter eternal significance. You were put on this planet to do more than waste your life trying to chase a dollar and die with possessions that have no meaning. You were created to make an eternal impact on the world. And this is the vehicle the church that he designed so that you could find it. You were created to make a contribution 
of eternal significance. And the church is supposed to be the place that gives you that opportunity to do that. Paul even makes that clear in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, start with verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now Paul's saying the reason why God has raised up leaders in the church is to equip everyone in the church to carry the ministry because collectively we can do more than any of us could do alone. We together can accomplish more than anything that you or I could attempt all by ourselves. That when we see that we are really a body and for us to function well, every part has to be healthy and doing what it was designed to do. When you see that, you see a church that makes a difference. You see a church that wins people to Jesus. You see a church that finds a way to feed families in the middle of a doggone pandemic. And you know, we know this concept of the body. It's littered all throughout scripture. Paul gives us this imagery. Go to Romans chapter 12. Start with verse 4. It says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the, to all the others. Verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. That every single one of us has something to offer the body of Christ. That means you. You. Who's convinced yourself that you have nothing to offer. If you didn't have anything to, to, to offer, guess what? You wouldn't be alive. If you didn't have something to offer God's kingdom, you wouldn't be alive. That God has created you and gifted you and given you passions and desires and gifts and talents for the sake of his glory and the building of his kingdom. And the sooner you realize that and realize that the vehicle that he wants you to do that through is his church, the more fulfilling your life will become. Paul uses this imagery more. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting with verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we're all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. That, yeah, we all have different gifts. And see, maybe the reason why there's such a lack of desire in the church to live this out is because we've created this hierarchy of service in the church as if certain positions are more valuable than others. And I think what Paul's trying to say here is that's not the case. And I think one of the reasons why we've seen something really special at this church is because we've managed to just break away that stereotype. It didn't matter if what's in your hand is a microphone or a door handle. It matters. It doesn't matter if you are changing a stinky diaper or teaching the word. It matters. It doesn't matter if you can eloquently sing a song or you're really good at holding an umbrella. It all matters. 
Every single bit of it matters. You have something to offer. You have something to contribute. And one of the greatest pleasures of my life has been watching people through the vehicle of this church step into their destiny. Move into areas that they never saw for themselves, but that God had ordained. And being somewhat able to be a part of helping walk them into a place where they discover those gifts and deploy those gifts and find fulfillment in it to the point they show up here at six o'clock in the morning on Sundays. And they invest in your children. And I've watched people move throughout these phases of life. And our church is better because of it. And today you get to hear a conversation that I had with two of those people who sat in those seats at one time, but now they sit in positions of leadership all because God had a plan for their lives. And so once again, like you've been doing the last few weeks, I want to let you listen in to a conversation that I had with Sananda McGee, our kids pastor, and Preston Steele, our student pastor. Turn your attention to the screens. Well, hey guys. Hello. Y'all are so excited to be here. Nobody loves being on camera more than Sananda McGee. But I am grateful for the opportunity to sit down with y'all just like I am everybody else. And we've been sitting here talking actually for a while. But we are moving into the opportunity piece of our vision where we're talking about in order to inspire people to live in love like Jesus, we need to create an opportunity for people to discover and deploy their God-given gifts to serve the church and advance God's kingdom. And every single area of our church is completely volunteer dependent. <laughs> so it's not like uh, kids ministry and student ministry are solely that. But throughout this, I want to give our key leaders an opportunity just to sit and have a conversation and give people a chance to get to, to know y'all. So Sananda is our kids pastor and Preston is our student pastor. And to me, the coolest thing about this conversation is both of y'all served in these areas of ministry before you were ever leading in it. When y'all got involved in these areas of ministry, there were other people that were sitting in those seats. And over the years, God has just worked and moved. You know, one of the things that uh, I think about at our church, I, I've always had this kind of belief that if you're not willing to serve, you're not qualified to lead. That a, a leader demonstrates commitment and passion independent of a paycheck and that kind of thing. So talk about how you ended up becoming student pastor and the evolution of all that. Yeah, so um, early on, I think it was probably, we came that first Sunday and we had known Casey and Rebecca Harris through Jenny and Jason from our old church because they had come and visited some. And so early on, I got involved helping him. And maybe the second week we were there, like I just... I had a passion for it just because I had experienced it as a teenager and knew the impact it had on me. So I got involved early on helping him as he was a student pastor. And, you know, he just took me under his wing, developed me as we grew, as the ministry grew. I learned a lot and he was encouraging, built me up as a leader. And then when he was going a different direction with ministry, um, you and I had that conversation and it, it, was, it was the perfect fit at the perfect time. And again, I can't speak to how much it impacted me when I was a, a young adult, a young student teenager. And so that was kind of where my passion came from. But it was a no-brainer for me to get involved in it right away just because of that. Now, your evolution in the kids was a little bit different where Casey had kind of felt like God was leading me in a different direction and passed the baton. So do you remember when you made that transition? Do you remember coming to my house and we had a conversation about, hey, you gonna be our next kids pastor? I do remember that. Yes. Uh, so I had never planned on leading anything. I just wanted to, I just wanted to serve. Um, and I did feel that kids was where I was called to be, but, um, you know, and I know I've told you this before, like I, you believed in me. I didn't believe in myself, but I believed in you. Mm. And then your faith in me is really the mm. reason I did it. Yeah. Yeah. What well, the coolest thing about your ministries is when a kid thinks about kids ministry, doesn't necessarily see your face in their mind. And when a student thinks about student ministry, doesn't necessarily think about your face because you create these teams that are investing in these kids. Talk about just that pressing from a student perspective and approaching it that way. 
So I think what's really cool about the way that we do students is unlike traditional student ministry, which we tried early on and it just, you know, it, it's a different age like we talked about. Um, they do get that interaction with those volunteers in an individual basis. You know, we split middle school and high school up, but then we go one step further and we split high school guys and high school girls and middle school guys and middle school girls. So I have volunteers that are over all sections of that, right? So like you said, they don't think about student ministry as me. They think about student ministry as Will and Rachel and Austin and Megan and Wendy and Sammy and Caitlin and Ben and Allison and Vanessa and Bra- I mean, all those people. I'm impressed that you just remember pretty much I every volunteer's I, I, name. <laughs> I, I, was doing, I was doing my due diligence. But they think about it as those people because as a middle school boy, which I have my son in there, so obviously I try to stay back from that. But as a middle school boy, they think, man, I go to students and I see, I see Brandon, if I'm a middle school girl, I see Vanessa or Ben or whoever it is, and that's the relationship they're building. Mm-hmm. And then they'll transition into high school and then they'll get to build a relationship with somebody else whose face they've seen, who they've known for these years. And that's something really cool about the season we're in with our church. It's the first generation of students that have come all the way through kids ministry into student ministry and we'll go all the way through. So it's a great season, but we try to approach it more from that small group atmosphere, like what what real church looks like when you get older. And the fact that our volunteers are so invested um, our high school girls have tremendous relationships with all of our high school girl leaders. Our high school guys are close with our high school guy leaders in the middle schools the same way. And so I think what that does long term is it builds, I think, back to like a Jeremy Taylor or a Dustin, right? These people who came through student ministry as students and now are so involved, but it builds that connection with the church and these people, right? And so that to me is the exciting part is that it's an experience that they're gonna be able to translate and take with them long-term with people who are gonna be part of the church and part of their life for a really long time. That's good. What are the things that have evolved in your heart and keep you kind of motivated to work with students in this crazy kind of age that we live in? Yeah, it's, uh, it is ever-changing, and you and I have had many conversations about what student ministry looks like now compared to when we were involved in it. Um, and for me, going back to the impact it played in my life, I didn't grow up in church, so I really didn't get involved in church at all until I was a teenager. Um, and so the fact that it had such an impact on me even then uh, helps me to realize that uh, these students who are you know middle school and above right now are in a the world's crazy, right? It's, it's just a place to navigate that for a 12 to 18 year old kid, it, it's just, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things that they need help navigating that, you know, necessarily may not be conversations they're having with their parents and those kind of things. Um, and I and my team, because I can't stress enough how great they are about recognizing those things and getting involved, really want to be that sounding board for them. We want to be we want to partner with the parents, but we also want to be that safe place with the kids, right? We want to be that place where they feel like they can open up, not be judged, but also be, again, that partnership with the parents too. And so uh, our main goal is to make sure they have some kind of rooted foundation in the fact that God loves them, that he is there for them no matter what, that he's that's not judging them, those kind of things, and give them that foundation. That's, that's our ultimate end goal yeah. when they leave and take the next step into what life is. Yeah. In Sananda, you know, one of the things that we've always said is that's not, children's ministry is not a daycare service while, while parents are in here worshiping, that we really are trying to inspire kids to live and love like Jesus. And the, the number of volunteers and the commitment that it takes, how do you get, talk, go into that a little bit deeper about the volunteer culture and that kind of stuff, because this is what I know about both of you guys, your volunteers are willing to do things that it's hard to get people to do. Um, I think that's, that's maybe even somewhat more so in kids at times because you gotta change diapers and you gotta deal with two-year-olds and I don't know if I'd rather deal with a two-year-old or a teenager. That may be a little bit, you know, and yeah. you probably have some wisdom into that. <laughs> um, but just talk about that volunteer culture and, and the way that volunteers are shaping kids to the ministry of our church. Um, yeah, I think that uh, in our classrooms, that I'm still amazed. I don't know. I don't know. People keep coming back, and they're excited. And I mean, especially this new season for us. I mean, people were just messaging me 
you know, for months, is when are we doing this? When are we doing this? And I mean, they're just, they're so excited. Um, the last two weeks that we've been open, like we've seen so much excitement from them. They just want to be in there. And it, it is a very demanding part of the church. It's a very thankless place to serve. It really is. There's yeah. a lot of, I mean, you come in and you, you're you the first one in and you are the last one to leave. A yeah. lot of times you don't even get to see people in the foyer, you know, because you're, you're just in the classroom the whole time. And, you know, the kids the kids are not thanking you for serving. <laughs> they're they're demanding things from you. So it is, it's, it's just amazing to see the way that these teachers just love seeing the kids and understanding their role um, as partnering with parents and families, understanding the, the role that they're playing, that they aren't babysitters. I think another thing too that's been really cool about watching our kids' ministry is we break some of the stereotypes. I think we have box in our mind. This is who serves in kids. Moms, women, that kind of stuff. How have you been able to get such diversity in kids' ministry? Because you've got... 20 something guys and you've got our 12 year old, 11 year old kids. Like how do you, I mean, I think that's the other thing too is people don't realize is oh, I can't serve in there. I can't serve in that area. How do you, how, do, how are you able to break that mindset? Well, we, we really love to, to put people where they feel that their gifts are. We don't just want to say like, here's, here's where we need something. Can you do that? You know, and that you have to fill that exact role. We've gone so far as to, you know, talk to people about where do you feel your strengths are and trying to figure out where they would fit best in the ministry. So, um, it's not just positions. It's also just, um, you know, finding people's gifts and strengths and, and putting them there. Even if that position didn't exist before, we have actually found places where they'll, they'll thrive and be able to, to invest in the kid's whatever, in whatever way that looks like. Um, so yeah, we have um, a little more freedom and, you know, we have a great curriculum and there's, and it guides you through a lot of stuff, but we also give a lot of room for, for them to bring their personalities into their small groups and stuff. And I think it, it is great to see um, how diverse our volunteer base is. It really is. Yeah. Well, you create something where you invest in people who invest in people who invest in people who invest in people, and it just, it's an ongoing thing. And I think one of the coolest ways to measure the effectiveness of both of what you guys do is you have people that come through your ministries and then immediately wanna contribute to those ministries. You have the students that you just mentioned who came through under the student ministry and immediately wanted to invest back in it. My kids who came through kids ministry and immediately want to invest back in it. And now I'll just kind of talk to you just as a dad um, that I'm so grateful that my kids get to be the benefit of the leadership of you two. There is not another two group, two people on the planet that I would want to entrust my own kids with. My kids are pretty great, so I'm told. And people ask me all the time, what happened? And I'm like, I don't know, me and, me and their mom have just not screwed them up, but you guys are, have played and are playing a big role in that. And I'm sure that there are other people on the other side of this camera that would say the same. So thank y'all for what you do means a lot. I think if we're all honest, we all have been the benefit of somebody who was willing to step up, step out of their comfort zone and take advantage of the opportunity given to them by the church to serve it and in turn served us. And you know, a long time ago, we stopped asking the question, what's next? for us as a church and started asking the question, who's next? Who will be the next person that decides that sitting isn't enough, that serving is what they're called to do? In whatever way they feel it. That as a church, if we're gonna inspire people to live in love like Jesus, we have to take advantage of the opportunity that the church gives us to discover and deploy the gifts that God has given us to serve his church and advance his mission. And I know there's a lot of excuses right now as to why we can't do that. 
It's a crazy season and I just don't have time. But can I just tell you, when we are finally on the other side of all this, this church is gonna need 10 times the volunteers it has because God's gonna do something great. And maybe you're sitting there and the reason why you're so hesitant is you just don't feel qualified. Well, welcome to the club. Because neither do I. You feel like there's just too much history, you're not worthy, there's too much baggage. You've done too many bad things that you feel like because of your past and your history that God could never significantly use you. Can I just point to you to scripture? And the people that God used all throughout the Bible should have felt the same way that you felt. Moses had anger management issues to the point where in a fit of rage, he killed a man. God still chose him to be the one to lead the nation of Israel out of Egypt. David had the biggest blunder in all of human history and he still was Israel's greatest king. Peter, just weeks after denying Jesus, was the one chosen to stand and preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Paul made it his mission to stomp out Christianity and oversaw the killing of people for their faith, and he became the one to plant churches all over the known world. So if you don't feel like you can, good because that's exactly who God chooses. There is something significant he has designed you to do, and this is the place to get started. And can I just say one thing? We will never serve out there if we can't serve in here. So would you bow your head and close your eyes for just a minute? Would you just spend some time asking God, God, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do with what I've heard today? What are you calling me to do? How are you calling me to serve? Not out of obligation, but out of obedience to what you've designed for my life. God, what do you want for me and from me? What opportunity do I need to take hold of? God, I pray that right now you would begin to just stir in the hearts of your people. There is a way for everyone to serve. I thank you for the creative things that you've designed in this church that give people opportunity that they never thought would be possible to use gifts they never thought they could use in the church. But here they are making a difference. And God, I just, who's next, God? God, who's the next Preston? Who's the next Sananda? Who's the next person that sits in these seats that you're calling, that you're stirring in them to do something significant, God, for your kingdom and glory? God, as we worship you, I pray that you would stir our hearts and help us to respond in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.